It's 2025 and it's time for my top five. This time around, I'm going to talk about my top five add-ons as I've done in the past and then throw a couple of extra things in there for you. So let's get started. So number one, as it has been in the past, is going to be my Z-Wave JS UI. Now Z-Wave JS UI is a control panel, allows you to configure your Z-Wave network and every aspect of your Z-Wave network. Uh, it is a standalone thing that allows you to send all of your information across via MQTT. You can also use uh, WebSockets, which is what is used by the Home Assistant Z-Wave JS integration. Uh, it's compatible with Home Assistant Z-Wave JS. Um, even if Home Assistant restarts, the Z-Wave network continues to run. You can use things like Node-RED with your Z-Wave network uh, or other things as well. And then you can use ESP based devices to directly respond or work with your Z Wave network. And then it pre-configures itself with the Mosquito add on. I have 22 devices in my Z Wave network, and this is what the add on looks like when you go to the add on page. If I open the web UI, you'll see these 22 devices. We'll go to compact view here. These are the 22 devices that I'm running within my Z Wave network. The reason this is number one is that my home assistant instance would not function or my smart home would not function without the Z-Wave JS integration. I have light switches, I have lamps, I have sensors, I have a bunch of stuff that runs on Z-Wave and it was really my very first RF network that I used with my home assistant instance. Since then I've added some Zigbee stuff and some more Wi-Fi stuff and some more matter capable things as well. But this is definitely my number one device that I'm using with Home Assistant. And without it, my smart home would not function. Now to control everything or to talk to everything back to Home Assistant, I am using the AOTech Z-Stick Plus or Z-Stick 7 Plus. Now this is the device I use for my Home Assistant uh, integration. It's this one right here. I used to use the Z-Stick 5 as well, um, but this is a newer version. It's uh, Gen 7 and it has longer operating distance, um, a lot more capability. Obviously, if you're going to go with a, a new Z-Wave setup, make sure you're getting the latest Z-Wave hub as well. All right, so that's the first one on my list. Let's go to number two. Number two, of course, is going to be my Zigbee to MQTT. This is another network that I run with my Home Assistant instance. It is a, a network that has 14 devices on it. Those 14 devices are mostly my alarm system and a lot of temperature and humidity sensors that I've got placed throughout the house. The reason I'm going with some of the Zigbee stuff is it's super small. I mean, it's a lot smaller than some of the Z-Wave stuff and the batteries last forever and you can get it cheaper than you can some of the Z-Wave stuff. So I've tried more of the Zigbee stuff and I've been quite pleased with it so far. It's been running in my house for a couple of years now. Uh, I'm using the Zigbee to MQTT uh, add-on. This is similar to the Z-Wave JS UI that also uses MQTT. So I'm sending all my stuff over MQTT and this is my, or this is the add-on obviously. Uh, it's ready for an update as a matter of fact. And then if I wanna open the web UI, we can see what we're running inside of this. And this is all of the stuff I'm running. I've got mostly Aquara devices, one Sonoff device. I've got a Lin Tech presence sensor uh, and then a bunch of um, more temperature and humidity sensors. I've got some uh, door and window sensors that I use in my security system. And you can look at a map uh, of this on this particular interface. And this is what the map looks like. It all connects back to the primary controller, which by the way, is actually a Home Assistant Connect, uh, Sky Connect, a ZBT1 is what they're calling it now. It used to be called the Sky Connect. And it adds Zigbee support to Home Assistant. So I'm running both a, a Z-Wave dongle and I'm also running this ZBT-1. It can also be a thread border router. If you decide to get this ZBT-1, you can use it for Zigbee as well as a thread border router. So uh, there's all kinds of specifications on here. Anyway, here's the map. Uh, some of these things are functioning, but they're not necessarily tied back to the controller. The only one that's not connected, and you'll see this error right here, um, it pops up every once in a while. It's because this thing is actually unplugged. Otherwise it would be connected back into this. Now, I have a hallway plug as a controller here and I have some devices that are con uh, closer to this network or to this plug as a, a secondary controller. But 
for whatever reason it doesn't connect there, it connects over here. All right, well anyway, the reason Zigbee is number two is obviously it is uh, 14 devices that are part of my home assistant infrastructure, um, namely temperature and humidity sensors, which are more of a informational thing. And then I have the alarm nodes, such as the door and window sensors that tie back into my alarm system through home assistance, alarm system through home assistant that also give me critical functioning within my home assistant or within my smart home. Well, that was a mouthful. All right. So that was number two of the, of the five things I'm going to talk about today. Number three would not be possible without the mosquito broker. And you can run your, your own standalone MQTT broker, or you can use the add-on that's in Home Assistant. I choose them to go this route. Uh, in some of my previous videos, I've shown other MQTT brokers, but for simplicity's sake, running the MQTT broker as an add-on in Home Assistant and getting updates through that mechanism is easier for long-term maintenance and keep upkeep of the, the stuff. So I just do it that way. There is a, this is the thing that makes the Z-Wave JS UI, which uses MQTT to communicate, and these, the Zigbee to MQTT add-on function. All those use MQTT. Traffic comes in from the nodes or the devices to those two add-ons, and those two add-ons send it to MQTT broker, which then Home Assistant reads and monitors, and then I can send commands back out the other direction. So without the Mosquito broker, none of this would actually be possible. And one thing that is true of all of these add-ons or so far, all these add-ons, there's a component that brings it from the home assistant add-on piece to home assistant itself. And that's the integration. And so for the mosquito broker, for example, I can look at this and I can click on configure, and then I can start seeing stuff that's coming in from my mosquito broker. Let me uh, listen to all topics here. Now you see the amount of traffic that's coming through from all of my devices out on my MQTT world, my Z-Wave JS and my uh, Zigbee to MQTT and have all that stuff come in through here in the Home Assistant through that broker. And you can also do the same thing with a tool that's called MQTT Explorer. Just bring that over here. And let me apologize for the video. It keeps going into full bright mode. I don't know what's happening with the camera. So every once in a while, you'll see the video change. Just ignore that. Anyway, we're talking about MQTT Explorer. This is the same thing we're looking at within the Home Assistant MQTT integration. You can see the same kind of information uh, in, a, in a better uh, drill down mode here. You can look at all of these topics and all of the messages that are coming across. And you can see that uh, Z-Wave has 4,768 messages, 3,103 topics, and then Zigbee is 454 messages with uh, 41 topics. So you can see it's quite busy. Uh, I don't know how it compares to other smart homes. I don't have a ton of things in my smart home, but um, it is quite a busy setup here for all of the information that's talking back between the something like 60 some odd devices that we have running in, the, in my smart home here. So M MQTT broker, super important to have that running because that's basically the communication path between all of my devices out of my smart home and home assistant itself. And without that, nothing's going to work. So uh, number three on my list. All right. So number four is actually going to be a bunch of different add-ons combined all together. And we're talking about the, the following add-ons here. We've got open wake word, Piper. Piper is a text to speech engine. Open wake word allows you to use your own wake word for your smart devices. And you see where I'm going here. We're also talking about, um, you can find it on here. Whisper, which is a speech to te text add-on. Those four or those three add-ons plus the Wyoming protocol allow you to do fully local voice control with your home assistant instance. So if you look at this right here, um, you need, you can use Whisper and Piper, which we just talked about. And then the Wyoming protocol will determine those. And you can also optionally use the open wake word. And when you have all of that set up, then you go over to your integrations. And this video is not about making this um, all work together. I'll, I'll do another video on that later on. Uh, but with the Wyoming protocol, you can see that we have three entities here. We've got Faster Whisper, which is actually Whisper. Faster Whisper is a smaller, more compact 
quicker, um, faster, faster uh, speech to text, no text to speech uh, engine. And then an open wake word and Piper, all those are combined together and it creates a communication channel between those. So here's our local control that I've set up. This uses Home Assistant as a conversation agent. That's basically the brains behind what you say and what is said back to you. We have Faster Whisper, which is the speech to text engine. That's what, here's what you say and sends it over to Home Assistant's conversation agent. And then we have text to speech which is what responds back to you with a voice. And you can choose a whole bunch of different voices here if you uh, want to. I've got this one, whatever that is. Now, in addition to using that local pipeline, you also can pair that with the new Home Assistant Voice Preview, which is the hardware that Home Assistant just came out with. And if you've watched my video or read my blog, it's here. But if you haven't, go read about it. It is the device that allows you to plug it in locally it's configured quickly, and then you have a smart home device, a smart home speaker that allows you to do your local control, or you can pair that up with an LLM and do some other stuff. So if I look at my voice settings again here, you'll see that I have a, uh, let's say chat, chat GPT thing here. I do have open AI conversation set up. That is a local or a large language model that I use, and I can use this uh, device here in order to make it seem more of a smart speaker type setup. So you have the option of doing all of those local control things with those add-ons, as well as uh, the option to do LLM and then use the hardware provided or that you can get through Home Assistant now, the Voice PE Preview Edition, and be able to control everything locally. So that makes a uh, number four on my list because we're gonna start seeing more and more local voice control that gives you privacy, that gives you local straight up local control of your home assistant instance, completely local if you have the hardware to run it. And it gives you a nice piece of hardware to use that has a decent speaker in it and has decent microphone and noise canceling capability to be able to hear you in noisy environments and be able to control your smart home that way. And then you can populate them around your house and do all kinds of stuff with your voice control stuff. Stuff, how many times did I say stuff? Anyway, that is number four. I'm excited to see what happens in the voice control world as they continue to evolve that. All right, number five is not actually an add-on, but it is more of a function of Home Assistant, and that is the automations. The reason I'm talking about this one in automations and not an add-on is because on my list this year, I don't have Node Red as one of my top five. It has been consistently one of my top fives because without it, a lot of my automations didn't run. Automations are really what make a smart home smart. If you don't have automations, then you just have the ability to turn things on and off without walking over and touching them. So with the smart home stuff, having mm -hmm. automations is requirement and Node-RED was doing that for me. Earlier this year, there was an issue during an upgrade of Node-RED that rendered some of my automations broken. That has since been fixed. Thank you, Frank, for doing that. Frank is the maintainer of the Node-RED add-on as well as bunches of other things. And he's also one of the uh, engineers that works for Nabucasa now and supports and develops Home Assistant. Anyway, he fixed it, but it drove me to figure out whether or not I could run automations directly in Home Assistant without using Node Red. That gives me two advantages. One, it's a little bit faster and it also removes a bottleneck or a point of failure. If Node Red quits working, then I lose my automations. The second thing is, I've had some occasions where I needed to make some quick modifications to an automation and you can't do that on your phone or your mobile device because it just doesn't, at least in my, my experience, doesn't allow you to do a lot of stuff. You can't drag and drop the flows, the, the connectors and everything that you do in Node Red on a mobile device. So I would have to go find a computer and log in and do it. Now I can just go in there and make a on the fly modification or enable or disable a piece of automation. So I have 97 automations. Not all of them are active, obviously. And I got some notes here. Let me see what I said. Uh, I have um, 50 automations that actually are running regularly. And I have 16 of those, I believe. Yep, I have 16 of those that I ported directly over from Nord Node Red. So I can come over here and look at which ones I brought over from Node Red. And these are all the ones that I've brought directly from Node Red, Node Red into uh, the automations 
Native Lean Home Assistant. What makes this hit my list, number one, is the fact that I'm not using Node Red anymore. Uh, and number two, when you go to create an automation by clicking this button over here, you have a whole bunch of new features. And when I say new, I'm saying since I started doing automations back when it was all YAML based only, you can create new automations, you can automate backups um, through the community. Now these are, some of these are blueprints, uh, but create a new automation. You can do a bunch of things through blueprints and that's what's extended the automations to make them so much more useful and easy to use by everybody is that those that are super smart, super smart have gone out there and created blueprints that you just bring into your home assistant instance and just fill in the blanks and you've got an automation. But the UI has come a long way. So you can add your triggers and your conditions. You can add building blocks. So you've got ands, nots, ors. Uh, you can do actions through all kinds of different things here. A lot of these are a lot easier to find. Um, you can do the triggers, which are now easier to find. So they've done a lot to improve the UI. They've done a lot to improve the way you can build these automations. And some of my automations in uh, from the Node Red, um, let's do one of my lighting things if I can find it. Let's look at this one right here. This is my alarm system. My alarm system has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different triggers that could happen through the alarm system. And then with that, I have all of these different uh, actions that can be done. And this is something that was very hard to do in the past. It wasn't, it was hard, but it was, it had a lot of coding you had to do with YAML. So if we take, for example, and we look at the, the actual YAML that's the, involved in this, we have all of this stuff here that goes on through that. And it's all done through the UI now. So it makes it super simple to build out automations using the, the UI that they've developed over the past few years. And it'll, it uh, doesn't require me to have to run Node Red anymore because the UI can handle a lot of what I'm doing. So that makes it number five on my list. And that's the reason why it's number five. It's not an add on, it's a technology that's now available and has been for a little bit in Home Assistant, but it's evolved a long way since the beginning. And it makes it useful and easier to use now for me, who's more of a power user, and through blueprints and other UI enhancement allows those that are not power users to build out their automations. So anyway, that's the top five for today, for 2025 of my add-ons and the additional technology, which is the automations. Let me know if you have any questions down below. Thank you for watching. If you're not a subscriber, you know how to do that. And uh, we will see you on the next video.